please welcome Congressman Mike Levin. Would you all please stand for the presentation of the colors? Today we are joined by VFW Dana Point, post 9934. Gentlemen. Now, normally what we do is have a, a guest come up from the audience to lead the pledge. I have very special guests that I'd like to come up and do this. It is the congressman's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Levin. Come on up. Well, thank you. That was unexpected. I'm so grateful to my parents uh, for being here and for giving the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm grateful to all of you for spending some time with us uh, this evening. Uh, I want to start by giving a round of applause to our wonderful staff who helped put this together, Ellen Montanari, who was absolutely amazing, our wonderful campaign team, Adam Berkowitz and Hunter Phillips, all the volunteers. If you volunteered, could you please raise your hand for this event? Could we please give them... A round of applause. I'd also like to thank uh, our uh, elected officials, both current and former, who were here. I saw my friend Larry Kramer. I, I think a couple more are going to be joining us, uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and Mom and Dad, thanks so much. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Chrissy and the kids, unfortunately, couldn't be here, but it's, it's really uh, a delight to have you here. Uh, and I want to thank our law enforcement who's here uh, tonight. Thank you for all that you do for our community. I am uh, very honored to be endorsed by a lot of the leading law enforcement organizations. PORAC, which is the largest uh, law enforcement organization in the state, the San Diego Police Officers Association, the Carlsbad Police Officers Association, also our great Orange County professional firefighters. So we greatly appreciate all that you do uh, to keep us safe. Uh, I also wanted to uh, really emphasize Q&A. That's why we do these, is to hear from you. Uh, and uh, that's really the most rewarding part of this for me, that I can take back uh, a lot of the comments, a lot of the ideas and priorities that you have back with me to Washington, D.C. Uh, that helps me do my job much better. I take the word representative very literally. And uh, this is now our, our 15th one of these. We do one a month. We'll be doing one a month for as long uh, as I'm honored to serve in Congress. Uh, we've also done 217 house parties and counting. Thank you, Hunter, for organizing probably about 150 of those. And we've done 25 community coffees as well. Uh, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to listen. Uh, that's what, for me, that's what the job is all about. And from a big picture perspective, I think the job is also about uh, trying to solve local problems however I can and working across the aisle whenever I can uh, to get that done. And I thought I would just share a few things with you tonight. Uh, because it's been about a year, a little over a year, and I think it's a good opportunity for me to just kind of provide an update on what we've been up to. Uh, first, well over half the bills, resolutions, or amendments that I've introduced or co-sponsored have been bipartisan, uh, and I think that uh, there's a lot more bipartisanship in Washington than uh, some in the news media uh, lead us to believe. Uh, and I also think an important role of any federal representative uh, is federal resources, bringing resources to the district and to the region. Uh, so I thought I'd highlight a few things that we've done. As part of the new trade deal between the United States, Canada, and Mexico, we were able to secure $300 million to finally clean up the cross-border pollution uh, at the Tijuana River Valley. Uh, I'm very grateful this required the Republican mayor of San Diego, 
the Trump administration. It also required the Speaker of the House of Representatives and your Senators, Dianne Feinstein, Kamala Harris, working with me and our San Diego and Orange County congressional delegations to finally get to that issue. Uh, as the San Diego Union Tribune wrote, and it was in their recent endorsement of me for re-election, so I was happy about that, this was, and I quote, one of the biggest victories for the local congressional delegation in years. I was very proud to be a part of it. Uh, we also secured $128 million in long overdue infrastructure funding for Camp Pendleton, including a new First Marine Expeditionary Force Consolidated Information Center, Ambulatory Care Center, Dental Clinic, and even a mess hall. And we got another $40 million in additional funds for a new elementary school on base. We often focus on our service members, rightfully so, and their spouses. We cannot forget about their children. And I was so grateful to see we got that uh, done as well. Uh, we helped some of the leading researchers in the world at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is at the very southern end of our district, uh, received $57 million to support programs to better inform water management in California, as well as to further study the role that our oceans play with regard to climate change. Uh, and we got over $13 million for local water management and supply projects in the district, including $8.3 million uh, in federal funding for the Doheny Ocean Desalination Project, which will be right down the street and will be run by the South Coast Water District. Uh, that funding is going to improve the local water supply here in South Orange County by producing up to 5,300 acre feet per year of new local drinking water. And we just secured, and it's, it's been a, an interesting day, I have to tell you, I was down in Encinitas earlier with a gentleman named Dr. Pat Davis. He lost his wife, his daughter, and his sister-in-law when a bluff collapsed on them. He was right next to them. And he has dedicated his life. I'd like to think that we would all be so strong if something like that were to happen to us. Somehow I doubt it. But he has dedicated the rest of his life to try to prevent a similar tragedy from occurring to any other family. And so we've been working with him and working with the Army Corps of Engineers and other interested stakeholders, and we were able to secure $505,000 for San Clemente and $400,000 for Encinitas and Solana Beach for long overdue Army Corps of Engineers projects to stabilize the bluffs and to secure our coast. And the project, I figured since we're in South OC, I would talk about the San Clemente project for just a minute. 505000 for the planning, engineering, and design phase of the San Clemente shoreline project, which focuses on providing protection for the train tracks along the Los Angeles, San Diego, San Luis Obispo rail corridor, also known as the Losan corridor, that runs immediately to the beach in San Clemente. The project is designed to protect the tracks while also protecting roads, buildings, and other infrastructure while maintaining the recreational use of San Clemente's beach. Uh, these funds are a necessary first step. 505000 is going to solve the entire problem, but what, they, what that fund does do, those funds do do, is it unlocks the uh, local and the state planning, engineering, and design funds that are necessary. And then once that planning, engineering, and design phase is complete, then we go back to the federal government to try to unlock the rest of the funding. And uh, we believe that, uh, I know for the Encinitas, Solana Beach area, it's around $30 million that they're going to need. We will find out what they need in San Clemente. And I know many of you have expressed problems in Capo Beach as well. So we're talking to our local stakeholders in Dana Point about how they can get into the, you know, the next tranche of study uh, for coastal protection. Finally, we got over $222 million dollars to help prevent veterans' suicide, which I think is a real breakthrough, and it's a record. And I'd like to speak for the moment about, thank you. I'd like to speak for a moment about the work we've done for veterans. Uh, can the veterans here please raise their hands? Can we give them a round of applause, please? I have the great honor to chair the House Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity with jurisdiction over veteran homelessness, housing, the GI Bill, transition assistance, and workforce development. And I've now helped to develop and introduce nine bipartisan pieces of legislation that have passed the House, of which two 
have already been signed into law by President Trump. And if you don't mind, I'd like to briefly share some of them. First, the Protect Affordable Mortgages for Veterans Act to maintain liquidity in the veteran home loan market. This bill was signed into law. Second, a bill to expand veterans' access to STEM scholarship programs, science, technology, engineering, and math, under the GI Bill. That also was signed into law. Third, the Veterans Education Transition and Opportunity Prioritization Plan, or VETOP, act to prioritize economic pro uh, programs at the VA. Fourth, the Vet Center Eligibility Act to expand eligibility to receive counseling from VA vet centers. Next, the Ryan Cool Specially Adaptive Housing Improvement Act to improve the VA's specially adapted housing program, provide more money for, for grants uh, for those that need uh, specially adapted housing. The Fry Scholarship Improvement Act to expand Fry Scholarship eligibility the Bill Mulder Transition Improvement Act to improve the transition assistance program for service members returning to civilian life. It's named after Bill Mulder, who was best friends uh, growing up with my friend, Representative Jody Arrington, Republican of Texas. Uh, Bill Mulder tragically took his own life at age 30 after serving in the Iraq War. And my friend Jody is convinced that we can do a lot better in the transition assistance program, and this bill aims to do that. Uh, the Protect the GI Bill Act to strengthen protections against predatory schools to make sure that they're not taking advantage. And then finally, a couple weeks ago, I introduced a bipartisan and bicameral bill, so both House and Senate, to provide parity in GI Bill benefits for members of the National Guard and Reserves who increasingly conduct similar training and missions as other service members but do not receive equal benefits. So that common sense legislation, thank you. That common sense legislation will finally bring basic fairness for service members who spend months away from family and risk their lives for our country but haven't received the benefits that they deserve. In addition to these bills, I've used my subcommittee, the gavel, uh, to make sure that we're highlighting uh, issues of veteran homelessness, veteran hunger, uh, trying to do something about the HUD-VASH program. That's a housing program for veterans. If you can believe it, we still have over 1,000 homeless veterans in Orange County and yet a third of the HUD-BASH housing vouchers go unused. So we introduced and passed legislation in the House to expand eligibility criteria for the HUD-BASH program. We also have to work on case manager uh, ratios as well as the amount you receive under the HUD-BASH program actually reflecting the fair market rent in a very expensive place like Orange County. I also sit on the VA Health Subcommittee. And I'll always do everything I possibly can to protect and strengthen VA health care. Uh, as I know from regular meetings with veteran service organizations both locally and in D.C., uh, as well as meetings with officials at the VA here in the district and in Washington, uh, I believe we need to fight the hollowing out of the VA uh, in furtherance of a privatization agenda that would dismantle the VA health care system piece by piece. I think we need to strengthen the VA, not dismantle it. Uh, and privatization will resort, result in worse medical service for veterans and higher costs for taxpayers. I recently finished a great book by President Trump's first VA secretary, a gentleman named David Shulkin. He wrote the following, and I quote, privatization leading to the dismantling of the department's extensive health care system is a terrible idea. The VA's understanding of service-related health problems and its special ability to work with veterans cannot be replicated. That's why as a member of the VA Health Subcommittee, I have vigorously opposed and will continue to vigorously oppose all efforts to privatize these vital services while helping to lead bipartisan legislation that will protect and strengthen the VA. That's what I'll continue to stand for. My grandfather was a World War II veteran. In general, this is some of the most rewarding work that I do in the House because we actually see the fruit of our labor. Even at this difficult time with a lot of division in Washington, this is an area where we work together and we get things done. Next, I'd like to highlight our work on the environment. Uh, and on climate change. I'm a member of the House Natural Resources Committee, the subcommittee on water and oceans, pretty important when you represent 52 miles of coastline, as I do. And I'm a member of the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, one of three Californians on that committee, one of three freshmen on that committee. Uh, I fought to protect our coast, uh, and you know that has materialized in the Tijuana River Valley that we mentioned and the bluff stabilization that we mentioned. It also is critically important, and I will do everything I possibly can to get the waste off the coast at San Onofre as quickly and as safely as possible. Uh, thank you. And 
I think it's important you understand the issues with San Onofre and that it really is uh, what we see there, the 1,700 tons of waste, it is a symptom of a greater problem. And the greater problem is that we lack a clear and comprehensive strategy to deal with spent nuclear fuel across the United States. And that's the problem that we need to solve because if we don't have anywhere to send the waste and we don't have any means to get it there, it's not going to happen. There are certain things that we did right away this year that I thought was important. So we've got about 120 sites across the country with spent nuclear fuel. But what makes us unique here in San Onofre and here in our surrounding community? Eight million people, including all of us, within 50 miles of that plant. Two active earthquake faults and a whole series of inactive earthquake faults and rising sea levels. That makes us very unique. So I introduced something with, in the help of Senator Feinstein as well, the Spent Fuel Prioritization Act. And what it says is for all those sites across the country, prioritize moving the waste first from those sites that have the highest seismic risk and the highest population density. And guess what? We score first. <laughs> so historically, the way it's been done is the, the oldest waste is moved first. We score somewhere in the middle. That's clearly not going to cut it. We've advocated for funding and legislation as well to support the development of an interim storage program at the Department of Energy as well as a consent-based process to find a permanent spent nuclear fuel repository. We put all of our money in Yucca Mountain in Nevada. Back in 1987, Congress decided that's where all... Who here has heard of Yucca Mountain? Oh, wow, almost everybody. So in 1987, Congress decided Yucca Mountain in Nevada would be the only place that we would send that waste. And then we spent $16 billion. And I have visited Yucca Mountain. And it is an amazing feat of engineering. Five miles of tunnels below the ground. And then the work continued in the 80s, the 90s, 2000s. And then Harry Reid. Remember Harry Reid? He was the senator and a majority leader in the Senate from Nevada. And not surprisingly, he didn't want all the nation's nuclear waste going to Nevada. So then, you know, we almost have the Nevada caucuses coming up, right? So in 2007, he convinced then-Senator Hillary Clinton and then-Senator Barack Obama that moving the waste to Nevada was a really bad idea. And then President Obama took office, and they stopped Yucca Mountain from moving forward. They created a Blue Ribbon Commission to try to find an alternative, but they never found an alternative. And then President Trump came in, and he started up Yucca Mountain funding again in his first two budgets. In fact, in the 20. Uh, in 19 budget, there was $90 million for Yucca Mountain. So maybe the door was back open. And then in a tweet, a couple weeks ago, because it's always a tweet, he said, <clears throat> along the lines of, I now respect the will of Nevada, and we are not moving forward with Yucca Mountain. So a lot of people shook their heads and said, okay, what do we do now? Well, what do we do now is what we should have done 10 years ago, which is find a permanent repository in the United States using a consent-based approach. And because finding a permanent repository and then citing it and then building the thing is going to take probably 30 or 40 or 50 years, we better do something in the interim. In the interim. And guess what? All the states interested in interim storage, Texas, Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico, they all say, we don't want to be an interim solution unless there's a permanent solution in the works because otherwise they'll become the permanent solution. And I understand why they don't want that. I wouldn't want that either. We're going to be coming out with a report. I created a task force before even being sworn into office. It's headed by the former head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission under President Obama and by a retired admiral. And the two of them have come up with a great report. I just reviewed a working final draft of it and all 30 or 40 members of our task force are now signing off. Hopefully you'll sign off, Larry. And uh, it has 31 recommendations, 31 recommendations, some federal, some state, some local. And I think, I hope that a lot of you will read it and a lot of you will understand uh, the complexity of the issue, but also the necessity to do something moving forward. So I'm, I'm absolutely committed to that. I want to talk for just a minute about health care. Uh, it's certainly been on my mind. First and foremost, I strongly believe we have to protect the Affordable Care Act. And this past year, we've protected the ACA from being dismantled, both in Congress and in the courts. And we've also introduced legislation and passed it in the House to reduce the cost of hospitalization and prescription drugs and to protect people with pre-existing 
conditions. We passed H.R. 3, named after my friend the late Elijah Cummings, the former chair of the Oversight Committee, the Lower Drug Costs Now Act, and what it does is establish a fair prescription price negotiation program, protects the Medicare program from excessive price increases, and establishes an out-of-pocket maximum, annual maximum for Medicare Part D. I think both Republicans and Democrats want to see at least that last piece. We want to see everything. We might disagree on how to get there, but particularly the out-of-pocket maximum in the Senate, they're talking about a $3,100 out-of-pocket annual maximum in the House. We want to see a $2,000. I'm hoping we can get that done in the new year. And as I mentioned, we also co-sponsored and passed legislation to ensure that individuals with pre-existing conditions receive the health care they need, increase coverage accessibility, and improve affordability. On the issue of women's health, I fought to protect reproductive rights. And I co-sponsored two bills, the Each Woman Act and the Women's Health Protection Act, to protect a woman's ability to determine herself what is best for her body, health, and family. Now, generally, thank you. Very basic. Let me be perfectly clear about it. I believe all Americans shouldn't have to choose between their health care and their rent and their food. We've got to provide quality and affordable health care for every person in this country, period. And that is exactly what I am committed to doing. And we've got to start by protecting the Affordable Care Act. I want to talk about taxes for a minute. I'm doing everything I can to lower taxes for the middle class and the working families of this district, and I believe we should roll back parts of the 2017 tax law that slashed taxes for billionaires and multinational corporations while raising taxes for many California homeowners and middle class families. And I've been focused like a laser beam on the state and local tax deduction. How many of you here take the state and local tax deduction? Quite a, quite a few. Well, usually. 43% of our district take the SALT deduction. And the basic bargain has always been that we pay more to the federal treasury than we get back. We are a donor state. Everybody know that? And, but the bargain has always been, and you all can, my mom and dad confirm with me, this has been the way since you've been paying taxes, you've been paying taxes for a while, that we've always been able to fully deduct the state and local taxes until the 2017 tax law that capped it at $10,000. Well, I mentioned 43% of our district takes the SALT deduction. On average, they deduct $24,900. Now, sometimes I hear, well, that deduction is only for rich people. So I looked it up. In our district alone, there are 86,000 people who make less than $100,000 a year who take the SALT deduction. If you're making less than $100,000 a year here in San Juan Capistrano, I do not think you are rich. I think that it is a tough, uh, it is a good salary, but it is a tough place to live from a cost of living perspective. The other deduction, $750,000 cap on the mortgage interest deduction. 26% of the mortgages in our district are more, for more than $750,000. So what I decided to do is work with my colleagues, and it was not Republicans and Democrats as much as it was geographic. So I worked with my colleagues from New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Illinois, other states that pay a lot of state and local tax to repeal the cap. And we passed it in the House. And I guarantee you, if we had Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer instead of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, we would pass it in the Senate and we would send it to the President's desk. So I think we can get that done. I've also tried to take a number of steps to help our local innovation economy. I fought any efforts to cut the budget for the National Institutes of Health, and we were able to do that again uh, for 2020 appropriations because it's critically important for this district, for our local life sciences and biotechnology industry. And I've also fought to end the culture of corruption in Washington. The first bill that we passed in the new Congress, H.R. 1, the For the People Act, expands voting rights, secures our election system against foreign interference. Think that's kind of important these days? And it removes the corrupting influence of dark money in American politics by making things far more transparent. We passed it in a bipartisan fashion in the House. We sent it to Mitch McConnell in the Senate, and you know what he called it? A power grab. And we said, right, it's a power grab by the American people trying to take their democracy back. 
So that's now sitting in the proverbial McConnell graveyard with a lot of other things. But we did work across the aisle and were able to get $425 million in the 2020 appropriations package for election security. And we have to make sure that that gets to their appropriate places so that we protect our system against foreign interference. Again, critically important. Finally, H.R. 4, the Voting Rights Advancement Act that we also passed out of the House to protect voting rights and oppose any voter discrimination efforts that would deny any American their constitutional right to vote. I'd also like to take just a minute and talk about immigration, something that's on a lot of people's minds. You would know it from looking at me, from my last name. You might not even know it from looking at my parents, but my mom can attest to it. Her parents came from Mexico at a very young age. Uh, and when they got here, they didn't speak English particularly well. They didn't have a lot of money. They had no formal education, but they worked incredibly hard. They sent all five of their daughters, including my mom, through college. In my mom's case, got a master's degree. And now their youngest grandson is a Congress member. That's pretty cool. That's the American dream. And absolutely. At age 50, my grandpa became an American citizen. My grandma passed at age 93. She was a permanent resident, never became a citizen. But they were treated with respect and dignity, and that's what I believe we have to continue doing. And I believe that we can have common sense, bipartisan, comprehensive immigration reform that treats people with dignity and has border security. We can do both. In fact, we have to do both. We have to do both. And I am committed, and I know many of my colleagues are committed to getting it done, but it seems as though both sides want the issue of immigration more than they actually want to fix the real problems in our system. So we're committed to working across the aisle and getting it done. We did pass H.R. 6, the Dream and Promise Act, to provide immigrants who came to the United States as young kids, like my grandparents did. Sometimes we call them dreamers. They contribute positively to our economy, to our society. This bill would provide them with a path to be able to stay with their families. So we were proud of that. Uh, what I want to see again, bipartisan, comprehensive immigration reform, and I think we can get it done. Just a couple more things. Since we're in South Orange County, I just want to comment for a minute on the toll road extension. You should know that I have been against any extension since the idea was first announced. I do know that we need to mitigate traffic. That much is true, but absolutely not with a toll road extension. And I don't support any of the proposals that I've seen, whether they go through San Juan Capistrano, San Clemente, Camp Pendleton, or otherwise. And I will always oppose any extension that encroaches on existing communities, schools, or protected open space. Further than that, since being in office, I've called for an audit of the TCA by our governor and our state controller. And I'll keep doing all I can to hold the TCA accountable. I also look forward to working with other relevant agencies, OCTA and others, to do all we can to provide the federal funding to support the programs that they want to see. And that's exactly the same thing I'm doing down in San Diego County with SANDAG. I don't pretend to uh, decide for the local communities. Each one have different interests, decide on how the federal government can be most helpful, and I will be there as a willing partner to deliver whatever resources I can to South Orange County. Finally, I thought I would talk for just a second about the latest budget proposal, which I don't think reflected a lot of the rhetoric that came from the President at the State of the Union. First, it dramatically cuts many of the programs that support the most vulnerable Americans. If your family depends on nutrition assistance, disability benefits, or health care through Medicare or Medicaid, then the budget turns its back on you. It has a 27% cut to the Environmental Protection Agency, and unfortunately puts the interests of big polluters ahead of the air we breathe and the water we drink. By the way, I don't think environmental issues were particularly partisan until 2010. What happened in 2010 was the Citizens United decision. And since then, the oil and coal and fossil fuel companies have put $300 million into federal elections. And you want to know why we can't get anything done on climate change. That's why. Third, the budget would cut the National Science Foundation by $540 million. This would be devastating for our district and our community and for UC Irvine and UC San Diego. And I will fight against it because we need those NSF funds for our great research universities. Fourth, the budget doesn't 
address what I see as one of the biggest problems we have, which is our debt and the deficits that we are running every year. Remember, and you can Google this, the president campaigned on eliminating the national debt in eight years. Eliminating the national debt in eight years. What we have done is we have driven up $3 trillion of additional debt. A big reason why was the 2017 tax bill. Paul Ryan, if you remember, he was the speaker at the time, he said, this will pay for itself. It did not pay for itself. Depending on your estimate, it has increased the debt by $1.5 to $1.9 trillion. Our deficit this year alone will be over a trillion dollars. This is not sustainable. And when the president campaigned and said he was the king of debt, I'm beginning to believe he was right. And we cannot continue on the current course. So what I would like to see is a bipartisan, bicameral commission, similar to the Simpson-Bowles Commission. Everybody remember that? Where we, we take a hard look at revenue, we take a hard look at spending, and we begin to get things under control. Because what is happening cannot continue. We cannot have a debt-to-GDP ratio that looks like a third world country. That's no way to lead in the world. So not all Democrats are afraid to talk about it. We need to work together with those on the other side of the aisle and actually have some sanity again. Well, finally, most importantly, as I've said before, I've tried to listen. Uh, we've held now 15 of these, 217 house parties, 25 community coffees, and the best part of these by far is listening to you. I've gone on way too long, so if, I want to turn it back over to Ellen for the Q&A portion, and thank you again. By the way, who is here for their town hall for the first time to a town hall? Can we give them a round of applause, please? Thank you for coming. Okay, um, I have picked someone from the audience. The first thing I did was ask if he had volunteered for Congressman Levin in the last election. He said no. So say hi to Al. Al, wave your hand. He's, <laughs> Al is going to be the one who pulls the tickets out for the raffle today. Okay, and then he will hand them to Misty, who's going to read them out to everybody. So each one of you will, if, if your number is called, just come over here, over along that wall, and, and uh, wait. We'll keep some people in line over there. Um, you have 60 seconds to ask your question, which is why we asked you to write it down, because 60 seconds goes pretty fast. Um, the congressman has three minutes to answer. They'll cut me off. Don't worry. <laughs> we, we ring a little bell for him, and then we ring it again, and then we ring it again, and he usually pays attention. Um, Misty will be holding the microphone, this one right here, so you can touch it, but you can't have it, <laughs> just so you know. So when we see this, we know that you're fighting for the mic. So, you know, I just want to let you know that we can see all that. When you come up, before you ask your question, please give your name. If you don't want to give your full name, just your first name and what, where, what city you live in. And then I'm going to ask, because we're so spread out this way, what I'm going to ask you to do is when you, after you ask your question, go sit down to listen to the answer. That way, the congressman isn't facing this way and no one over here can see him. So he's going to be answering the question out here. So you may as well go sit down so he can see your face. Okay? Is that it? All right. Misty, it's all yours. What's our buzzer sound like tonight? Sometimes it's loud. They got to cut me off. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Okay, I'm calling the last three digits on your ticket. One, two, seven. One, zero, four. One, zero, eight. I did want to say one thing, which is a shout out to everybody watching on Facebook Live. And particularly if my in-laws are watching in Tucson, Arizona, hello and I love you. <laughs> Hi, Mike. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. My name is Mike, too. I live here in San Juan for about the last 14 years. And uh, you were talking a little bit about the desalinization plant. And I just wanted to know if you ever thought about maybe convincing Edison to convert that San Onofre into a desalinization plant. 
It's a great question, Mike. I think that there is a golden opportunity to take that San Onofre site and turn it into something incredible. Uh, but first and foremost, we've got to get the uh, reactor domes out of there. That's going to take about eight years. And then we're going to have to remediate the site uh, per the plan that uh, Edison has put forward. Uh, now, I think that long term, first of all, the Navy did not sign up for a nuclear waste site to be there forever. That site is owned by the Navy and the DOD. Uh, they wanted a power plant there. They didn't want spent fuel there forever and ever and ever. But what I do think makes a whole lot of sense, one of two things. Either you use it for training and readiness and preparation of our troops, because Camp Pendleton obviously is across the street, or you take advantage of the fact that it already has existing uh, infrastructure, the synchronous condensers that were put in after the last uh, big blackout that happened back several years ago. So it actually does have some electricity infrastructure separate from the uh, Song's plant. So I think the idea of some sort of clean energy system there or a desalination system there, all those are going to be great problems to have, hopefully in like 10 years, when we're not worried about the nuclear waste sitting 100 feet from the ocean. One, two, two. Hi there. My name's, good thanks. Uh, my name's Nancy Egan. I'm from San Clemente. And my question is regarding uh, the homeless. You touched a little bit with the veterans. What role can the federal government help with us with our crisis here? Well, thank you very much uh, for that question. So I've been in uh, close touch. You know, San Clemente has had a lot of issues uh, over the past year or two, uh, really all throughout South Orange County. Uh, it is an incredibly complex problem with no easy solution. It's going to require a multifaceted solution that focuses on housing, but a lot of other things too. Uh, mental health is absolutely critical. Addiction uh, treatment is absolutely critical. Uh, and I've seen this through the lens of veterans, specifically because of the jurisdiction of my uh, subcommittee. What I know is that in our district, there are probably between 250 and 300 homeless veterans. And I have a goal of getting that to zero, an effective rate of zero. And we're going to, do an, we're going to need to do a number of things to, to get there. And that's with additional help uh, because of the way that VA functions. Uh, I am concerned, though, that, uh, for example, SNAP, which is uh, the uh, Nutrition Assistance Program, when they had the new proposed rulemaking for SNAP, and they have now uh, removed about 7 million people from the roles of SNAP since Trump has been in office, but there was very little, in fact, no consideration given, because I asked at a hearing, did USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, who administers the Nutrition Assistance Program, ever talk to VA about how many veterans would be impacted by the proposed rulemaking? And they hadn't even talked. They hadn't even picked up the phone and called. Now, why is that important? Well, obviously, housing, food, nutrition, uh, being able to find a job, it all directly relates. Also, ability to uh, have access to VA services. If you are uh, other than honorably discharged, you are not uh, able to access the HUD-BASH program to get a voucher to find a place to live. And so that's why we ran that bill to try to expand eligibility uh, for the HUD-BASH program. So I have been focused like a laser beam on veteran homelessness. In our district, we figure there's probably uh, on the order of 900 to 1,000 homeless. Um, in San Diego County, it's more like 9,000. In Orange County, it's about 9,000, 10,000, give or take. The good news is that uh, we are making progress. It's slow progress, but the rate of veteran homelessness has been cut dramatically down since 2010. What's interesting is the rate of female veteran homelessness has gone up. And so we tried through the SSBH, Supportive Services to, for Veteran Housing Program, to set aside $20 million and we got it through the House, but unfortunately it didn't get into the final appropriations package. We're going to try again this year. One of the most uh, stunning interactions I've had at any of the hearings that I've done was with a young woman who served in the Iraq War and was on the brink of homelessness, but was afraid to go to get services because she was worried that Child Protective Services was going to take away her child. And we've got to make sure that veterans know that they do not have to be afraid of seeking services lest their children be taken away. So 
We're going to partner as well with the, last thing I'll say, we're going to partner with the United Way. They do, and, and uh, for my father-in-law, if he's watching, he ran the United Way in southern Arizona for over 30 years. They do great work here in Orange County, and we're going to partner with them on a series, I hope, including here in San Juan Capistrano, of homeless, Homelessness 101 uh, meetings so that those who are truly interested in how to address the issue can learn more about it. Thank you very much for the question. 126 and 123. Uh, uh, Larry Kramer, 18-year uh, resident of San Juan Capistrano. I really appreciate your support of finding solutions to the climate crisis. You've been great, fantastic. Now, do you see any movement on the part of your Republican peers? Because without them, we're not going to get it done. Thank you, Larry. The answer is yes. So, but it's really interesting, the dynamic. So I know many of my Republican colleagues, including those that I sit on the select committee uh, for climate, I know they want to do something. I know they believe uh, that we need more resiliency. One of the uh, leaders on the other side of the aisle is a friend of mine from Louisiana, Garrett Graves. He represents a district in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They are seeing the impacts of the climate crisis firsthand. And so a group of them actually came together with Kevin McCarthy uh, and they put together a modest, but nonetheless, a package of legislation. Uh, really doesn't solve the climate crisis, but nonetheless, it's positive. It's better than nothing. But they were immediately criticized by the oil and coal industry, saying, what are you doing? And the challenge that we have, again, I said it before, it is the campaign finance system. Because the oil and the coal companies, they had an opportunity to invest in science and research and clean energy, solar, wind, battery storage, all the rest. And instead, they invested in politicians to the tune, since 2010, of 300 million in federal campaigns alone. And as long as we have that broken campaign finance system and too many, frankly, on both sides of the aisle who are beholden to the oil and coal industry, it's going to be very difficult to envision positive change. And unfortunately, we need somebody at the top in the Oval Office who is pro-science and who actually supports the overwhelming opinion of their own researchers, which is that the climate is changing and that we are on an unsustainable course. Who here has heard of the Keeling Curve? Anybody? So it was developed locally at in La Jolla, 1958, in fact, Keeling's son just got a million and a half dollar grant uh, today that we found out about, uh, which we're really excited about. But Keeling started measuring in 1958 the amount of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. When he first measured it, it was 315 million parts per million, or 315 parts per million. Now, anybody know what it is? 414.7 parts per million. 350 is the number where scientists overwhelmingly agree you're going to see serious impacts to our climate. And not only to our climate, but to our economy. That's the other thing, is that we often say, you know, somehow along the way, that if we protect the climate, that, it ha that somehow it's going to be bad for the economy. The opposite is true. We've demonstrated it to be true in California, that if you invest in the clean energy jobs of the future, in solar and wind and battery storage and electric vehicles. And if we lead in this innovation, we are going to create a huge number of jobs. We now have five times the number of clean energy jobs in California as we do fossil fuel jobs. And we can do it at the federal level as well if only we get out of our own way. Thank you. 110. One, one one four and one one eight. Okay. Hi. How are you? Hi. Oh, do you want me? You want to hold it? Okay. Hi. <laughs> you can turn me off. Hi. My name is Marianne Davidson. I live in San Juan, and uh, my husband is a retired Marine, and I have been a nurse for over fifty years. I won't tell you how long, because then you'll do the math. Um, and so you're working on a lot of issues that are really important to us. Um, I did notice that you had some uh, 
$25 million to go to the CDC to work on gun violence. And that, since I have two young grandchildren, is a really important issue to me. I marched in Washington last year. And besides getting the CDC to treat this as the um, public health issue that it is, what else can, can you do? Well, thank you so much for that question. Thank you to your husband for his service. Thank you for uh, your service as well. And she's absolutely right. It was a breakthrough that we got $25 million in the NIH and the CDC to study the root cause of gun violence. And look, if anything else killed 40,000 people in this country a year, we would want to know why. And that's all that this money is designed to do. Now, we have to make sure that it goes to the right people in the right places. There's a great gun violence prevention research initiative up at UC Davis, so I hope that they are going to be a part of this solution. We also passed H.R. 8 and H.R. 1112, two bills, H.R. 8 overwhelmingly supported by the American public and a bipartisan bill to provide universal background checks for firearm purchases. We also passed H.R. 1112, which would close something called the Charleston loophole. You might remember there was a shooting in Charleston, South Carolina. The shooter, Dylan Roof, was able to purchase a gun despite the fact that he had failed an FBI background check. This would close that loophole. We sent both of those bills, again, to you-know-who, Mitch McConnell, where they have been collecting dust for over a year. It is unacceptable that that continues to occur. And so we have to make sure that we do everything we can to not only fight to protect the House, but to try to flip the Senate, to try to get Mitch McConnell a different line of work, if possible. But if nothing else, somebody in there who will actually work with us. And, And there is precedent for bipartisan collaboration on many controversial and complicated issues. Dick Durbin of Illinois, great senator from Illinois, was in the House for many years before that. I asked Senator Durbin, have you ever seen anything like this with McConnell where you had such obstruction? And he said, no, not even Newt Gingrich. You could even work with Newt Gingrich. And so we've never seen this before. And I hope we never see it again. Thank you for the question. One three one. I'm only one three one. That's fine. I oh you. yeah, I'm not supposed to touch. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> She's tough. Watch yeah, out. Hi. Yeah, uh, I'm Gary Haslam. We, my wife and I, live up in Ladera Ranch, and uh, a lot of the people, in fact, a great number of the people in that area, are doing well and have big homes, and so to them. Taxes is everything. And so, of course, your opponents are trying to paint you as a heavy tax type guy. How do you, get the, how do you convince them that really, if you look in the, the last 40 years, that actually the economy has done better under Democrats than Republicans, but they have this myth out there that they're trying to promote. How, are you going to, how do you try to get some of those uh, voters to support you? Well, I would just look at what I've actually tried to do since I've been in office, and that starts with the state and local tax deduction uh, cap of 10000 being repealed and the $750,000 mortgage interest deduction being repealed. Now, I know, because my wife and I lived in Ladera for a year before we moved to San Juan, that a lot of people in Ladera have mortgages of above $750,000. I don't know the exact percentage, but I would say relative to the rest of our district, it's probably pretty high, and if you can't fully deduct that mortgage interest, and if you get hit on property taxes as well. Now, I know property taxes are pretty high there, too, and I know they're high where we live. I, I think most people are, you know, somewhere between a, a percent and two percent in property taxes. So that right there is your 10000 and if you can't fully deduct that, then you're going to take a hit. And I was just talking to somebody the other day who does pretty well, and w he has two kids, and he makes pretty good money, and he was able to buy his first, and they're teenagers. The, the, his son is now 18, his daughter is 16. He was able to buy his 18-year-old a car from his tax refund several, a few years ago, and now he had to pay $2,700 in taxes. And so he couldn't buy, you know, his, his son's off with a nice Volkswagen Jetta, and he had to go and buy a jalopy for his daughter. 
And that's just one example. But I, you would be amazed. I hear that from so many people in our district that their tax bills went up. And look, it is good that the stock market went up. But I also think that a rising tide should lift all boats. And our economy does best when we grow it from the middle out, not from the top down. And a lot of those big corporate CEOs, they got stock buybacks, they got dividends, they were able to make a fortune. Well, a lot of working men and women in our communities that I talk to each and every day, they did not make a fortune. So we've just got to get some basic fairness back, and we've also got to do something about the debt because our children, our grandchildren, and their children are going to be the ones who have to pay. Thank you for the question. One 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 and one one five. <laughs> Dennis from Dana Point. Hi, Dennis. I'm going to try to sneak in two questions. Have yes. you endorsed a uh, Democratic candidate, and if not, why not? Have not, have not, and uh, I got to tell you. I mean, I'm going to be totally honest about this. The I have my ballot. I usually go. You know, I like to. I'm, I'm probably going to go on election day. We're 11 days away right now. I don't know who I'm going to vote for. And I've never had that happen before. Now, everybody needs to go vote. That's important. We can't have paralysis by uh, analysis and then don't go vote at all. That can't happen. Uh, but uh, I will support absolutely whoever the Democratic nominee is against this president. I think it's time for a new president. Uh, I watched the debate like everybody else, like 20 million other Americans, and you know, I, I hope that we're able to put things on a more positive trajectory as Democrats, but I always go back to the famous uh, Will Rogers quote, which was, I am not a member of an organized political party, I'm a Democrat. And that was very evident the other night if you watched that debate. Thank you for the question. 105. Uh, good evening. Hi, how are you? Thank you. Uh, my wife and I, Mary, uh, moved to Dana Point about 13 years ago. I have a request and a question. Yes, my sir. request is I have on speed dial on my phone in the car 202-456-1111. That's the office of the president. Please call when you have a gripe. <laughs> my question is I voted. I voted for you. I voted for Mayor Pete. Yeah. Now, if Mayor Pete doesn't make it, maybe Bernie does. Can you please explain to me Medicare for all and free tuition? What is the economic impact? I hear these fuzzy, ambiguous numbers. I want a Democrat in office, but Bernie, I, I can't quite grasp the math. Well, all I would say to you, I've learned a lot in a year, uh, but something that I have learned, which inherently we all know to be the case, but when you serve in Washington in Congress, you really know is true is that any proposal needs 218 votes to pass. And so whoever the next president is, for that matter, if we're with the same president for the next four years, whatever their ideas are, whatever their vision is, they're going to need 218 votes in the House to pass anything. And unless they eliminate the filibuster in the Senate, they're going to need a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate. Some things they can do with budget reconciliation with a clear majority in the Senate, but for a big, bold idea like either of the ones that you just said, they're going to need 60 votes, and that's going to be really, really tough. And let me give you a couple of examples. In for the Affordable Care Act, remember the compromise that was made where President Obama wanted a public option and had uh, that on the table, and then they had to negotiate with Joe Lieberman and others, and that wound up being taken out uh, of the bill. Uh, that's one example. Number two uh, was in 2017, President Trump took office and they tried to do Trump care. And they passed Trump care by the narrowest of margins in the House. And they had the House, they had the Senate, they had the White House, right? The Republicans. It got to the Senate, and they wanted to do the mini Trump care. And it got all the way, and they were going to do it with 50 votes until John McCain, the late great John McCain, gave it the thumbs down. So why, why do I bring that up? I bring it up because that's what's going to be needed in a new administration to work with, whether we have the House, the Senate, the White House, or some variation thereof, we've got to work together and we've tried to, got to try to come up with something that's going to benefit the American people, and that's what I hope happens. Thank you. 
106. Hi, Mike. I'm Natalie Stein, a 25-year resident of San Clemente. Great. And in 2018, Democrats got the House. I want to know how many Democratic Congress people are up for re-election this time. All of them. We're a, no. <laughs> everybody. everybody. We all run every two years. It's fun. I promise. No. <laughs> Yeah, everybody runs every two, and uh, you know they asked me when did I start running for re-election. It was literally the Thursday after the Tuesday uh, started running for re-election. So yeah, that's all part of the fun. And you wonder why do all these House members want to be in the Senate? It's because you get a six-year term. That's why. But I think there's actually great wisdom in what the founders decided with regard to those two-year terms, because do you think all the House members would be doing a zillion town halls all the time? A lot of them don't do it anyway, but I think that level of transparency and accountability is exactly what the framers had in mind, and that's exactly um, you know, what we all try to, many of us try to do. Now, what I will say is that the House is not something we can take for granted. To your question, there are 31 districts that were uh, Trump won districts that are held by Democrats, and then there are 12 that were uh, won by Secretary Clinton, but were previously won by uh, Mitt Romney including our district. So 31 and 12, and the majority is only 17 seats. So we have to work hard, is my point. Thank you. 116. Hi, how are you? Uh, uh, I'm Derek, and I'm from San Clemente. And I want to put you on the spot. Yes, sir. Ask the same question, maybe a different way. Who in the White House? Yeah. is going to help you the most to help us. And we have a choice, right? You know, between yeah. Bernie and the rest of them. Okay, so can you tell me what do you think? Who will be the best person to help you to help us? Um, one of our supporters has a shirt. It says ABT, anybody but Trump. <laughs> and, you know, and look, if, if President Trump, right now if I had to handicap it, it's a 50-50. And if President Trump were to win re-election, we're going to work with President Trump. We have worked on things like veterans' issues. Of course, it's tough to work on climate change when he doesn't believe in climate change. Uh, but we're, whoever is in there, we're going to have to have the same calculation, which is how do we work for this community to bring federal resources here to support our veterans, to support our industry, to grow our economy, to deal with the problems we face, and work across the aisle to do it. And you know that's the beauty of our system. And are there definitely some that I think I could work better with than others? Of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that any of them that I saw up in that debate stage the other night would be better than who we have today. One, one, two. <laughs> Hello, Hi, uh, my name you? is Bob. And my wife, Joan, and I live in Rancho, Mission Viejo, Great. just down the road. Oh, yeah. And uh, so my brief question, how much federal assistance should California expect to receive for relocating coastal roads and utilities in preparation for rising sea levels with ever-increasing erosion? I know you touched briefly on moving some tracks, but in the future, it's going to be a lot more than that. I think it's going to be a huge federal investment that's needed, and not just in California, but all across the United States in those areas that are going to be impacted by climate change. That, those are things that we agree with our Republican colleagues on, that we have held hearings on, and it's going to be uh, a lot of federal investment. And here in California, uh, we have an amazing coastline. And that's why many of us moved here. Uh, but we also have a new normal with fires, floods, drought, erosion. And it's not getting better anytime soon. It's not getting better. So what we do with regard to sand replenishment and things of that nature on an annual basis, those are Band-Aids. Those are Band-Aids. In my district, that low sand corridor that I mentioned, eventually will have to come inland. It just has to happen, the, the rail corridor. And that is a multi-billion dollar project. And it impacts the entire, virtually the entire district, all the way down San Clemente, all the way through, obviously, in North County, San Diego. 
And my district, like many of the districts across the United States, are going to require multi-billion dollar projects to deal with the worst impact of climate change. What we know from the science is the more greenhouse gases that are emitted in the atmosphere, the more parts per million we see per the Keeling curve, the worse it will be, or the worse it will be. And that also leads to the economic damage. And a lot of times we talk about the costs of doing something about climate change. But I would encourage you all, talk about the costs of doing nothing. The costs of doing nothing. My friend uh, from Marshall Burke from Stanford University, economist, my alma mater, he put it at 25 to 35 trillion dollars this century if we do nothing. And so tell me we can't uh, figure out a way to get it done. I think we can, and we have to. One two nine one zero three. Uh, good evening, Mike. Uh, Hi, my name is you? fine. Uh, my name is Ludo. I'm a 28-year resident of uh, San Juan Capistrano. Great. I got a sense of what your stance was on uh, universal health care. My question is, why is it when there are rebuttals to universal health care, they always talk about the in incredible costs? but no one seems to calculate the incredibly exorbitant costs right now, right. not only of individuals insured, but of all the entities that provide insurance, let alone the incredible cost of absorbing um, ill uninsured. Well, it's amazing. You know, I work in Washington, D.C., 135 days a year. There are a lot of uh, health care lobbyists that work there. In fact, probably for every member of Congress, there are probably 10 of them or more. And what always happens is that the insurance lobbyists, they'll come in and they'll blame the drug companies. The drug company lobbyists, they'll blame the pharmacy benefit managers. The, drug comp or the pharmacy ben benefit managers will blame the hospitals. The hospitals will blame somebody else, and it's just a revolving circle, and nothing gets done. And too many people also are completely beholden to all of their PAC money, frankly. And so there are now 60 of us, by the way, that don't take any corporate PAC money. When I started, it was seven, and then 50 of us got elected. And so that's really important. It's really important because they wield a lot of influence. Take, for example, HR3, the bill that I mentioned before to lower the cost of prescription drugs. That would have created a national... Uh, direct negotiation between Medicare and Health and Human Services for the top 250 drugs in the United States, insulin being an incredibly important one where we pay way too much for insulin in this country versus any other industrialized country. And what the bill would have done is it would have said that the price of those most commonly used drugs cannot exceed 120% of what they pay in other large industrialized countries. And it also would have set a cap on Medicare Part D of $2,000. Now, compared to a lot of other proposals out there, that's fairly modest, right? You would not believe the amount of pushback that we got from all those groups I just mentioned and more. So again, whoever the next president is, they're going to have to be mindful of the fact, number one, that the current Speaker of the House, her signature legislative accomplishment was the Affordable Care Act. And we need to protect and defend the Affordable Care Act. And number two, that anything we do needs 218 votes in the House and a majority in the Senate. So with that in mind, we absolutely have to get to quality and accessible health care for everyone in the United States of America. I commend everyone who has that objective. Let's work together and let's figure out the best way we can get it done. Thank you for the question. 132. One, two, eight. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Joy Barris, uh, Rancho Mission Viejo. So I have a, a federal court matter question. What do we do to get at Attorney General Barr disbarred? <laughs> well, thank you for the question, Joy. You know, I called for... Bill Barr's resignation in May of last year. 
and he has done nothing since to dissuade me of my notion that he is acting more like the president's personal attorney than the attorney general of the United States should act. And so I recently called for his resignation again. Now, he's, bar he's uh, part of the Virginia Bar. He's a member of the Virginia Bar, and I do know that those in the Virginia Bar are taking a look uh, to, to see if there is any cause for disciplinary action. Uh, what I can say is it's really unprecedented what's happening with the, the, the sentencing of Roger Stone. Uh, that was uh, completely uncalled for, totally unprecedented, and indicative that, unfortunately, the president, you know, Susan Collins of Maine, uh, said, well, the president's learned, hopefully he's learned his lesson. Well, the lesson that he learned is that no one will stop him. And so now we're seeing this even with the new hiring of this uh, acting director of national intelligence who is a loyalist and the firing of DNI McGuire after uh, the intelligence community briefed a bipartisan delegation. If you're going to brief a bipartisan congressional delegation by default, it has to include the head of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. That's Mr. Schiff and President Trump and Mr. Schiff don't always see eye to eye. <laughs> and the fact that Mr. Schiff got the briefing from the uh, intelligence community, that set the president off. He said, we're going to fire uh, DNI McGuire, someone who has served admirably. And I worry when our intelligence community uh, no longer has that independence that was intended. I worry when the Justice Department no longer has that independence that was intended. And what we need to do is, unfortunately, here's the reality, we need to enact significant democracy reforms from pre to prevent authoritarianism in our country. And the, the reality is, under this administration, with Mitch McConnell running the Senate, it's not going to happen. But I know they're writing legislation as we speak, and I know they're going to continue. I'm not on the Oversight Committee, but I know the Oversight Committee is going to continue to do its job as well, to hold hearings and to try to get to the truth whenever possible. Thank you, Joy. One, two, one, one, two, five. Hi, how are you? Hi, Representative Levin. Uh, my name is Justin. Uh, I live in uh, San Diego, North County. Uh, my question um, sort of related to the previous question. Uh, would you support a constitutional amendment to require Senate advice and consent for presidential pardons? Ooh. Um, I saw that uh, proposal uh, earlier this morning in an op-ed in Los Angeles Times. That's something that I think we should consider. Uh, I think that the presidential pardon power cannot be used uh, to uh, try to exonerate people in an attempt to cover up potentially corrupt behavior by the president. We clearly haven't seen this before, and we are going to need to have to take steps to uh, remedy this from happening again. But, it, you know, the, the pre this president is not going to do anything to limit his own power, which he believes is, as he said, he was the chief law enforcement officer of the country, which that's not what the framers had in mind exactly with the pardon power. Um, but uh, I do think that in a new administration, again, getting back to the last question, we are going to have to enact generational democracy reforms that protect against a would-be authoritarian. And they'll be the boldest reforms that we've seen since Watergate, and probably bolder than that, uh, because we've got to learn the lessons here and we have to see where the system has failed us, and we've got to try to prevent it from failing us in the future. Thank you for the question. One, two, one, 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 three, one, three, four. Hello, I'm uh, Steve from Capistrano Beach. Hi, Steve. And a question about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, unintended consequence of it has been California has been importing people with drug and alcohol problems from all over the country. And a sad fact about rehab is that it often fails. These people relapse and end up uh, homeless on our streets. Is there anything that can be done at the national level to help with that? 
Yeah, we, we've written letters. So the patient brokering problem is a big problem. And we have an issue in our South County communities with uh, residential recovery facilities, also known as sober living homes. We've got about 100 of them in South Orange County. Uh, and they're challenging to deal with. Uh, a lot of it is uh, state jurisdiction. And I know there's some state legislation. Uh, the two overarching federal bills uh, that uh, we run up against are the Fair Housing Act, uh, which clearly, if you know, you you uh, you don't want to do anything to undermine uh, people from uh, housing access, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, because when you have more than six people who are disabled uh, under the ADA and addiction being a disability, uh, and they live together, then you've got fair housing issues. So that's why this is so tricky. Uh, now, there are uh, a lot of smart people at the local level who are working very hard on this, uh, but we've got a balance, and I, I firmly believe we have to protect the character of our individual communities. Uh, and that's something that I think is critically important here in San Juan and in San Clemente and in Dana Point, uh, where I see far too many of these recovery centers po uh, popping up that are churning through patients and that are using, in an unintended fashion, certain provisions of the Affordable Care Act in a uh, way that was never intended, but you're right. And so we have written, uh, with regard to patient brokering, bless you, HHS and others, uh, to uh, alert them to the problem, number one, and to try to crack down on it. And there's actually bipartisan, bicameral legislation on that uh, as well. But your point is well taken. It's a key concern of our community, and I'll do whatever I can uh, to try to help address it. Thank you for the question. One three zero and one three three. My name is Pani Narinder. I'm a um, resident of San Juan Capistrano. Great. Moved from Claremont, so uh, my vote now counts a lot more. All right. Excellent. And, uh, Good decision. And two years ago, obviously, we voted Good for you. Thank and you. my friends now can, can say, cats make fun of me for having moved to Orange County. <laughs> so my, I want to come back to the uh, universal health care uh -huh. because you seem tiptoeing a little bit, and I'm not quite sure where you stand. I applaud you for s supporting the Affordable Care Act, but it's not going far enough. Mm -hmm. And my daughter is a uh, physician in training, meaning a med student, and she's seeing the ridiculous uh, erosion of what this uh, Trump administration is trying to do via, obviously, the uh, Congress uh, in each of the states. So. Uh, you know, Planned Parenthood being uh, closed in certain states. So, you know, in, in other words, I'm also asking you, who are you supporting, right? Right. Good try. Good try. Here's, here's the issue that I see. We as, and I was watching that debate the other night, and I've watched probably seven or eight of the other debates as well, and the Democrats are tying each other in knots over Medicare when they should be talking about the fact that the Trump administration is trying to take $845 billion away from the Medicare program in order to pay for that tax cut that I mentioned before where 81% of the benefit went to the top 1% of taxpayers. We should be doing everything we possibly can to protect Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, all of which were dramatically cut again in the 2020 Trump budget. Now, I support universal health care. I am also pragmatic enough to know, after a year in Congress, that it's not going to happen overnight, and it's not going to be easy to do, which is why we have to, number one, know who the next President of the United States is going to be. If this President gets another four years, we're going to be playing defense to protect Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. That's just the bottom line. He said as such, the President was in uh, Europe at the World Economic Forum in Davos with the wealthiest people in the world. And he said he was open to going after he's, uh, you know, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid. Some people call them entitlements. I don't think that's the right term. That is insurance that you paid for. You paid for it. So I'm honored to be endorsed by uh, the leading groups uh, protecting Social Security and Medicare and Planned Parenthood and others, and I'll continue to work with them and anybody who's willing to work with me to try to get to that uh, universal health care goal that we all share. 
Thank you. 102117. Can I have the mic? No. Oh, all right, then hold it up here. <laughs> Hi. My name you is. You really wanted that mic. I'm a singer. I'm used to holding the mic. <laughs> we didn't have the national anthem before, so, you know. <laughs> no, not. Uh, my name is Cheryl Silverstein, and I lived in San Clemente for 19 years. I work in San Clemente. And I live in San Juan. I downsized. Great. Great. <laughs> so my question is, it's about the middle class. Yeah. I am the middle class. And I've worked my butt off for a million, for about 44 years. I've been a marriage and family therapist in private practice in San Clemente. And I take insurance for clients. And I see the military. And I see victims of crime. And I see everybody. Okay, so then I get a disease. I got rheumatoid arthritis, and I was on Humira. And when you are not old enough for Medicare, you get a little coupon for $5, and that's all you have to pay for your insurance. Well, one day I have a birthday, and I turn 65, and now my insurance went up to $6,000 a month. Not insurance payment, the insurance fee for the medicine. So my doctor says, okay, write to the company, write to the foundation of Humira. So I wrote to the letters. I'm very good. I'm very articulate. I know how to write a letter. I'm sorry, you make too much money. Okay. <laughs> if I pay $6,000 a month for this medicine, I will be so poor that I will qualify. But they said, write me next year. So luckily, my doctor and my nurse practitioner God bless them. They were wonderful. They came up with an idea how I can get my medicine by charging it to the Medicare part of the medical part of the Medicare instead of the pharmaceutical. So I got my medicine, a different medicine, not the one I was on, and I am pain-free and I'm happy and I can work and everything. But I felt so deserted by this country and by the whole thing, paying my taxes, working hard, helping other people my whole life. And... How can you prevent this from happening to other people? Wow. Well, the first thing I would say, you look fantastic, way under 65. Nowhere near 65. Um, absolutely. Uh, two things came to mind when, when you said that. Uh, number one is that our office exists to help with situations exactly like what you were facing. So we have a district office here in Dana Point, not far from here at the Dana Point Civic Center. We have another one for our friends in North County, San Diego, and Oceanside. And we are there to help with Medicare, Social Security, veterans issues, immigration issues. And if we cannot help, uh, we can hopefully find you someone who can at the state or local level. But I would have uh, loved our health care caseworker to try to work with you on that. There's no question uh, that uh, the system uh, doesn't work uh, nearly as effectively or as efficiently, uh, particularly uh, if you are perceived as making too much to qualify. Uh, and uh, that's something that we've uh, absolutely got to work on, and that's where simpler would be better. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the uh, biggest issues that I see when we see casework uh, when it comes to Medicare are just the complications of the system. And so anything we can do to try to streamline and simplify I would support wholeheartedly, but I'm glad that it sounds like you got that worked out. Uh, but if you ever have any other issues or if anybody else has any other issues, please come see us. We'd love to be helpful. Thank you. 107. One, two, zero. One, one, nine. One, zero, nine. Okay. You got all. Oh, I love that. Got through all of them. That's great. Hello, Congressman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you <clears throat> so much for your, your service, and we appreciate your representation of our, our community. We're so glad that you are where you are. Thank you. 
you, ha you have to thank my wife. If you ever see my wonderful wife, please thank her, because she puts up with this. Well, uh, you've, you've mentioned several um, things that would help our community, but have died in the Senate, okay? Uh, now, while we absolutely have to get rid of the person that lives in the White House today, okay, uh, and we've got to absolutely hold on to the House, we've got to flip the Senate because, again, everything dies there. What my concern is that I'm not feeling a whole lot of united effort by the Democratic Party to do that. Do you know of any effort uh, in this uh, for getting yeah. rid of the... So the, the Democratic uh, Senatorial Campaign Committee, thank you for the question. What was your name, by the way? Michelle. Michelle. Awesome. So there's... Uh, the DSCC, Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, their whole responsibility is to try to elect Democrats in the Senate and to uh, have a new Democratic majority in the Senate, and I think we can do it. Uh, there are three states that are true toss-ups. Uh, we have to, the, the scenario is we have to either win four if Doug Jones in Alabama loses, or if Doug Jones in Alabama wins, we have to win three. Make sense? So. Three that I think are absolute toss-ups, and then one that I think is slightly leaning to the Republican, but not by much. The three that are absolute toss-ups, or maybe even going our way a little, Mark Kelly in Arizona, John Hickenlooper in Colorado, Cal Cunningham in North Carolina. That is a true toss-up. The latest poll had Cunningham up by two on Tillis, so that would be great. And of course, if Doug Jones wins, that would be it. We'd have majority. I think Sarah Gideon, who's running against uh, in, uh, Susan Collins in Maine, would be great as well. It's going to be it's going to be tough to win against Susan Collins in Maine, but that race is very close, and it's going to be far tougher still. I know everybody wants to see McConnell, you know, un under the gun. It's going to be really tough to beat McConnell in Kentucky, uh, but it can be done. We have a new Democratic governor in Kentucky. Uh, Brashear, who, who beat the Republican incumbent there, and they did it by prioritizing uh, the issues of Kentucky, not the issues of Washington. And so I think there's something we can learn from that. But you're absolutely right, and I, I would just go to dscc.org, uh, I think it is. And then the, for the House, it's called the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. And, of course, the Republicans have the same. They have the NRCC. They have the NRSC, I think it's called. And the DNC, Democratic National Committee, that exists to help take back the White House. And, boy, we really need to do that, too. So, yeah, it's going to be a busy year. It's going to be a busy year. Mark Kelly, yeah, he was the first one. And I was honored, by the way, Mark Kelly, amazing guy, and his wife, Gabby Giffords, former member of Congress, who was tragically shot in Tucson, Arizona, right near where my uh, in-laws live, where my uh, wife was raised. I was very honored to just get the endorsement again of the Giffords campaign to prevent gun violence. It's a great organization, and <laughs> along with Moms Demand Action and the Brady campaign, Every Town for Gun Safety, there are a lot of amazing organizations that are working to prevent gun violence. And I forgot to mention one thing, which is we're working with the Brady campaign. To your question before, uh, I'm leading something called the Prevent Family Fire Act, which is, wait for it, a bipartisan gun violence prevention bill. Those exist, and what this bill would do is, it sounds really simple, but it's impactful. Turns out that if uh, people have a firearm in the home and they just have it in a safe, they just have it locked, the rate of accident goes down 74%. And so what the bill would do is provide a tax credit for safe storage devices. Simple, simple. And so right now we've got nine Democrats, nine Republicans. And I think that's one where we hopefully can break through the noise and get it done. But the one thing I will say is that the NRA, just like the fossil fuel industry, since the Citizens United decision, they have put hundreds of millions of dollars into federal campaigns, and only recently, since 2018, have we seen a concerted attempt by groups like Moms Demand Action, the Giffords Campaign, Every Town, and others to try to fight that with resources on the side of gun violence prevention. Yes? 
Congressman, this is your last question. All right. But before we do that, because I know the minute that happens, y'all are going to get up and leave and you won't listen to anything <laughs> I say. So I have the mic. I took it from Misty. The only person who can. <laughs> so um, I want to say thank you first to the volunteers who helped me put these on. I know Mike said thank you to me, and, and you mentioned the volunteers, but none of this can happen without the 50 or so volunteers that, that show up every month, um, both here and behind the scenes. Also, thanks to the Orange County Sheriff's Department for being here. Thank you all very much. Thank you, guys. Now, we have these town halls every month, and now that you've been here, you will probably never get an invitation again. Now, that doesn't mean you can't come, but one of the things that we work really hard to do is invite people who have never been to a town hall. So if you want to come to future ones, you are absolutely welcome to do that, but don't be looking for an email about them. That's all I want to say. Um, one of the ways you can find out where and when they are, and this is going to sound really creepy, um, you can follow me on Eventbrite. I, I know, it's, it's weird. But I found out from somebody that that's how they find out when the town halls are, because they get a little note every time I post an Eventbrite. So it's Ellen Montanari, you can go look that up. Um, you, um, Mike mentioned the cameras in the back of the room. Um, we're on Facebook Live, so turn around and wave to everybody. There you are, see? for all of you at home. Um, if for some reason you can't make it to a town hall, these are on Mike's website, uh, mikelevin.org, or no, Mike Levin Facebook, yeah. So anyway, so look for that, and the, we keep the past ones up there too, so you can always go back and look at them. Um, if any of you wanted to ask a question and decided not to put a ticket in, you can always send a question to info at mikelevin.org. It's really simple, info at mikelevin.org. Don't expect an answer really fast. Okay, um, they get literally over a thousand questions a week. So it takes, I'm like there's one person who actually goes through them and then farms them out to the different experts, okay? So if you don't get one in a couple of weeks, send one again, okay? So it's nothing personal, just know that um, a new member of Congress has a pretty small staff. So, oh and my God, my daughter's trying to call me again. So, well, she, she knows that these things go till seven. And so there she is. Okay, um, <laughs> all of you were given white evaluation cards. Um, so please fill them out. I read each and every one. Tell us what we did well. Tell us what we could do better because we incorporate those every single time. So that's it from me. And it's now up to you. But it is seven o'clock. I know. No, it's all right. I'm holding the mic. Hi, Mike. My name is Judith Anderson, and I'm a resident of 30 years of San Juan Capistrano, but originally from Michigan. Mm. And um, first of all, I want to thank you, because I know there's a lot of people like myself that are very concerned about climate change and the climate crisis, and now we already know that you're with us on this, and you're working on a bipartisan level. And thank you for supporting H.R. 763, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And if anyone doesn't know what that is, I'll let you tell them. Right. <laughs> and then um, I'm really happy to see, you know, that you mentioned you were uh, played a leadership role in election security. Mm -hmm. And this really concerns myself and I, I, uh, obviously so many other people here. So what do you think, as far as election security in this 2020, voter vote counting? Because we know, you know, it's important that we all vote, but it's who counts the votes that is important, and or suppression, voter suppression in swing states. Well, thank you for uh, the question, and thank you for your advocacy for you and for Larry and others. I know uh, part of Citizens Climate Lobby, an amazing uh, citizen group, grassroots group, and they pushed for the uh, carbon fee and dividend uh, 763, and it's a bipartisan climate bill, and we're going to have that bill as part of our climate action plan, which the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis will be releasing, I hope, sometime in the next month or two. Uh, I think that bill uh, is one of many opportunities uh, to uh, put some sort of price on carbon uh, that will uh, incentivize people to pollute less. Uh, and uh, I hope that, uh, you know, obviously we're going to work with you for a long time to come uh, to try to address the crisis. Uh, with regard to election security, 
Again, we got the $425 million in the appropriations package. Uh, we wanted $600 million. McConnell uh, countered with $200 million, and we wound up with $425, which was great. And now we have to make sure that that money goes to the right places. Um, what I'm concerned about, I'm not concerned about California. I just had an event a couple days ago with Alex Padilla, our Secretary of State. I believe that we are going to count the vote in California, that we're going to do it. Uh, largely, uh, paper ballots sometimes are better. Sometimes less technology is better than more technology, and voting, turns out, is one of those areas where that uh, is the case. And what I worry about, the good part about the American electoral system is that we've got, basically, at the county level and at the state level, uh, things are done independently. That's the good part and the bad part. Uh, but for here in Orange County, we have an excellent registrar, Neil Kelly, somebody who's been at it for a long time. And there is a new system, the voting centers. Everybody knows about this? So starting, I think, tomorrow, the voting centers will be open. And if you're interested in where you vote, so it's different than before. Before you had you know, your, your uh, absentee ballot, uh, you could drop it off at a public library, or you could go on election day. Obviously, you could mail it in. Or you could go on election day to a polling place, and you could vote at the polling place. Now there's going to be these voting centers. They're going to be strategically located all throughout Orange County. You'll be able to go starting tomorrow. Everybody got their ballot in the mail, I hope, right? Everyone was mailed a ballot. Whether you were absentee or not, everybody got a ballot. You'll now have the next 10 days to drop that ballot off at any of those voting centers, or you can drop it off. They have these boxes that look somewhat like post office, a drop box or post office uh, mail. Uh, but it's orange and black. It says County of Orange, and you can drop your ballot off there as well. The idea was behind that, a lot of people, they've said they want Saturday voting or they want to be able to vote you know, some other day of the week other than Tuesday, and this will provide them the opportunity to do that any day over the next 10 days. And the most important thing is that you remember there's an election coming up. Presumably you know that. You're here tonight, but coming up on March 3rd, the worst thing in the world is when I call voters or I knock on somebody's door, they say, yeah, I like you. I can't wait to vote for you in June. <laughs> no, March 3rd. So we're coming up on it 11 days from today. And that is a fantastic place to leave this because if you are interested in helping us in any way, shape, or form, we could use your help. Our great campaign team is here. They're constantly signing up volunteers. We need people to do everything from uh, knocking on doors, to making calls, to stuffing envelopes. For those who are interested in uh, supporting us with a house party, uh, we have house parties coming up. Uh, all it takes is opening your home, and we can do the rest, uh, and we will reach out to your neighbors and your community uh, to try to uh, educate others on what we're up to, what our values are, and why we're doing this. So I'm extremely grateful to Ellen Montanari again. Where did Ellen go? She just left. Unbelievable. But I just tell her when you see her that I'm grateful to her and to our whole team of amazing volunteers and our great staff, most importantly, to my wonderful wife and our kids who are not here, to my parents who are here. I'm grateful to you. I love you. Thank you for coming, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Take care.